All right, I think it's nine, and uh, we're supposed to start at nine. Uh, all right, hello and welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Ali Mirzayan, and I will be the session chair for this part of this event. Um, today we're gonna start a session with a great talk by Dr. Maryam Sadari on the topic of AI in dermatology. Dr. Sadari is the CEO and co-founder of Meta Optima Technology Incorporation. She was born in Miyane in Iran and she got her bachelor in computer hardware engineering in the Iran University of Science and Technology in Tehran. Then uh, she moved to Canada in 2007 and she got her PhD in computing science at Simon Fraser University in Medical Image Analysis Lab. In 2012, she, she uh, co-founded Meta Optima Technology Incorporation with Dr. Majid uh, Razmara in Vancouver, Canada, where uh, Moloscope and Derm Engine were developed in, for intelligence dermatology, smart skin imaging, analytics and management. Recently, Dr. Sadari was appointed as a MI Tax Research Council member, and she is a well-known, uh, um, she is known as one of the most influential women in BC Business Magazine, and her company was listed as uh, a ready-to-rocket business in the area of digital health. Dr. Sadari became um, a Canadian citizen in 2017 and won can, uh, can, uh, Canada's top 25 immigrant uh, award in 2019 for her success and leadership in R&D and building a fast-growing successful business. Since the development of Meta Optima, it has become one of the uh, fastest growing digital health technology companies in can Canada with successful um, expansion into US, UK, Italy, Australia, and New Zealand. By having said that, um, I invite Dr. Sadari to deliver her presentation. Um, if she's with us now, um, I'm not sure that um, Dr. Sadari is present now. Um, otherwise, we play a pre-recorded presentation Then Dr. Sadari hopefully uh, will join us in the midway. Hello everyone, it's a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, my name is Mariam Sadegi. I'm the um, CEO and co-founder of Medoptima Technology. Um, today I will be talking about AI in dermatology and it's a real uh, great pleasure to join you all in the fourth IPM Advances Club Computing Artificial Intelligence Program. Um, when I was preparing for my talk, I was wondering what is the best um, topic that I can cover today. And thanks to the organizers and their help with deciding on the topic, um, I decided to talk about my journey. As a computer scientist uh, with training in AI and dermatology, and also as an entrepreneur, um, someone who is using AI and building tools, intelligent tools, um, to help patients and doctors. Um, and this is actually now not just a research project, but also is taking those research results and the, the systems that we had developed to real life applications. So today I will be talking about our applications in AI and dermatology, and I will walk you through my journey. Uh, my undergrad was in computer engineering. I graduated from um, IUSD, Iran University of Science and Technology from Tehran. It was a great time um, and I decided to uh, move to Canada for my PhD studies. Uh, and my PhD was in computing science from uh, Simon Fraser University. And also I had a second scholarship in dermatology training. Um, I was CIHR scholar and I was trained at UBC Dermatology and BC Cancer Agency for my PhD research. Um, after graduation, I also 
um, co-founded uh, Medoptima, uh, the company that we have today with my co-founder and my husband and my best friend, Majid. He is also a PhD in computing science and his focus was on natural language processing and machine learning. Um, so this is me in, uh, in the middle here, uh, back in uh, high school days in Iran in my small hometown, Miana, in Azerbaijan, East Azerbaijan or Azerbaijan Shari. Uh, I didn't know I'm gonna be a computer scientist. I didn't know I will start uh, my business. I will be an entrepreneur. I didn't even know I'm gonna immigrate to Canada. I just knew that whatever I want to do, I will do my best and I really want to be really good at it. I remember telling myself that it doesn't matter if you are a chef, if you are a barber, if you are an engineer, an artist, you should be really, really good at what you do so that we, we can enjoy. Um, so what you do is actually fun. Um, and this is actually showing me here uh, with my PhD supervisor, um, Dr. Selatkin. She was a real role model for me when I started my PhD program at SFU in Canada. And also my PhD supervisor, Dr. Tim Lee from BC Cancer Agency, who really introduced me to the medical field and working with BC Cancer Agency with our doctors and oncologists and dermatopathologists was a real experience that you could see how the intersection of two different fields, totally different, medical and oncology and dermatology with computing science and technology can actually make a big difference. In addition to the um, research and to school and all the assignments and homework, I also managed to be active in the other areas, such as promoting computing science for women. And coming from Iran, I um, was raised with this value of education and we all <laughs> were aiming for PhD and we were all going for either engineering or medicine or law school, like um, you all know in, in Iran, the culture uh, is highly valuing higher education for everyone, including women. Uh, it was a little bit different in Canada and we had this, this program to help with uh, promoting computing science, mathematics, engineering for uh, high school girls in, in high school and even elementary school. Um, so uh, I actually, in those programs, I talked about programming, about AI, about computing science, not just as coding and sitting, you know, all day behind your computer and coding, but also working on real applications that you enjoy. And also you get a chance to present your results. I traveled a lot in my PhD program to many countries. I really enjoyed um, also living in Canada, uh, in beautiful Vancouver, very close to ski resorts and also um, a very beautiful mountains here that we enjoyed hiking, camping. Uh, so this was a real a fun journey of hard work, many days, many nights, um, deadlines, but also I still managed to have fun and enjoy um, that, that part of my life that I can tell it was, um, yeah, I had some of the best days of my life in my PhD program. Um, so the topic of my thesis was pattern matching and um, medical image analysis to help with identifying and diagnosing skin cancers. The topic of my thesis was um, towards pre uh, prevention and diagnosis of skin cancers. And we were using machine learning and image processing algorithms to analyze images of um, dermoscopy images of the skin. So uh, this was in my uh, PhD thesis um, defense that I created this mock-up application for the results of my thesis. I worked on images and on analyzing images, comparing the accuracy of the algorithms for diagnosing, for example, the skin cancers, finding um, different visual clues for um, important for skin cancer diagnosis, for example. But I knew that there will be an application one day that we will use these algorithms 
to help with diagnosing skin problems and specifically in this case was skin cancer. So these are the mock-ups that we created. Um, we didn't have a product. Uh, it was just the graphs, uh, the images from my thesis in this format that I was dreaming one day this will be an application that will be used by families, patients, and also by doctors. Um, it was it was a really good time, very successful. Um, I won so many um, national, international awards for the algorithms that we had developed. Also, I won the uh, SFU's uh, Dean Medal, um, the best um, doctoral award from CIP uh, PRS, which was um, um, basically in, in Canada, one of the top awards. Uh, the silver medal from um, Microsoft ACM competition and also the gold award from the World Congress of Dermatology. Our research also was um, uh, featured on top journals, conferences, and media as well. I also won the Innovation Challenge Award from the Minister of State in Canada for my work in my PhD. It was uh, a lot of recognition from the um, scientific community, computing science, and also from the dermatology community. And I remember in one of the uh, competitions in the World Congress of Dermatology, um, one of the judges uh, in that competition came to us and actually he told me that you are lucky that you are living at this age that people are using computers and you have a great chance to take what you have developed in your PhD to build a product. And uh, he was Dr. Scott Menzies from Melanoma Institute of Australia. Uh, he told me that we had this idea, but we were just too early for it 20 years ago. Now is the right time. You guys should take this to the next stage. Um, that was actually the time that we decided to um, start MedOptima with the vision that we digitize dermatology and we bring artificial intelligence to help with diagnosing skin problems, specifically uh, in this case, actually in my, uh, in my case was skin cancer. So co-founded the company with uh, Majid. Um, he, as I mentioned, he also has PhD in computing science. We worked together in my PhD program as well. So he was the co-author of some of the publications I had. So we decided together to start the company and build a product that can help with diagnosing skin problems. Um, our vision was to be the global leader in intelligent derm dermatology. We had no excuse to fail. Uh, we had training in computing science and AI and machine learning and medical imaging. I also had training in dermatology and we were supported by some of the best dermatologists and scientists around the world to take this to the next phase because this was also a shared vision and dream that technology will come one day and will help us with diagnosing skin problems better. Uh, today we have a big team of scientists, passionate engineers, students, medical advisors, and amazing investors behind a company uh, that we all share the same dream and vision of using technology to help millions of patients around the world. We recently, last month, actually in July, celebrated reaching over 1 million patients, and we have over 4 million cases in the system, serving over 870 medical centers globally, with the vision to save life for patients and save time and cost for the system to better um, serve our patients globally. Um, dermatology uh, is a big um, uh, problem. When you look at the numbers, over 2 billion people suffer from skin cancer, skin problems um, globally. And this is more than 15% of all medical visits um, that actually we see uh, in this industry. There's a long wait time to see a specialist in most countries where you have the public health system like Canada, like the UK, Australia, um, where you need referral for uh, dermatology. Um, it means that we have our primary care doctors in the front line serving our patients when they don't have training. Uh, so this is actually leading to a high misdiagnosis and low accuracy in the primary care sector and also errors in diagnosis that is costing 
patients' lives, and also it's costing a lot um, in, uh, in terms of the cost for the system. The first focus for uh, Medoptima was skin cancer because of our training and all of our work and publications in this domain. Um, I was shocked how archaic was the um, dermatology in general and also like a skin cancer um, departments. Two in three Australians, one in five Americans, and one in seven Canadians develop a skin cancer in their lifetime. Um, the rate is doubling every 10 years. And uh, when you look at the numbers, over 150 million patients worldwide suffer from skin cancer. If you detect early, um, melanoma is a deadly form of uh, skin cancer. If you diagnose it early, the survival rate is almost 100%. That goes down to 15% with latest stage diagnosis. Uh, also, when you look at the cost, uh, if you take it early, it, it can be as low as $200 for simple biopsy excision. That actually goes to over $150,000 with latest stage diagnosis and treatments. So when you look at the numbers really, like when you have a solution, when you have a technology and you're deciding if this has the potential to be a business, to be a product, you need to look at the numbers very closely and you need to see who needs it, who will pay for it, why they should pay for it. And then basically this is like just the beginning of your business plan development. So I will focus on some of these aspects just in case if some of you have um, developed uh, systems, technology, algorithms, AI tools that you are thinking about commercialization. I will just share my experience and I'm hoping that this can help with uh, some of the decisions that you will be making um, along your journey. So uh, when you look at the system, this big uh, turqua section here is showing the unnecessary costs for the system. We have 39 nine biopsies to find one melanoma in primary care sector. This means um, we are wasting a lot of money, 97% false positives and unnecessary procedures. Even our expert dermatologists, they have the best ratio is almost like two to one to find a melanoma. On the other side, you will see that there are many cancers missed, misdiagnosed, late diagnosis, and this is also costing our patients life. So this is like the small intersection, the true positive of what's happening in this uh, basically uh, segment. So we need to dramatically improve the system to save costs and also save lives. So this is a very well known fact you will see in many publications when we talk about dermatology, diagnosis, cost, and the accuracy of the system. So the solution that we had for this problem was using AI and diagnostic AI technology to help with achieving super human performance. So we can actually help our doctors with better diagnosis. The system should be scalable should be um, secure, should be affordable and accessible so that we can serve thousands of doctors around the world to serve millions of patients. And that is our solution to help with saving lives for our patients and also saving costs and time for the system. So the decision was really around digitizing the ecosystem first because it was an archaic uh, system. We didn't have basic digital tools in dermatology. If you are familiar with radiology, hospitals are digital. They have PAC systems, they have radiology, MRI machines and CT scan tools, and it's all digitized. But when you come to dermatology and dermato-oncology, unfortunately it was, it is still, I believe, in many parts of the world, very archaic, under-digitized, uh, very manual, subjective, and there was a big room for improvement there. So we decided with digitizing the ecosystem, building our Derm Engine platform, which is a cloud-based system, to digitize this and make sure we have a system, we have a solution that our doctors love it. So we watch our performance, uh, the feedback from our doctors regularly, and we have a very high uh, NPS score, which is a net promoter score that your users are providing as they use the platform, how much they love it. Um, so if you have a good system that you have users, this means there are more real life data 
This means a better product, better AI system. And this is the positive loop that is just bringing more users. The system is getting smarter and smarter and actually is contributing with, uh, to the faster uh, growth of the business and also the product. So we have uh, two products, our Derm Engine platform, which is the software solution um, that is uh, inclusive. It works with all other devices in the market. It also works with our own devices they have for dermoscopy. Uh, we have Moscope, uh, which is an affordable quality um, dermoscopy device that uh, offers uh, high quality uh, magnified cross-polarized images. Uh, we also have our Moscope 3, which is another version uh, of the device. Uh, but you don't have to use these devices to be able to use our AI system. Basically, you can use any um, other tools uh, in the market for imaging, and our system will still work with them. So, of course, uh, my full disclosure at the beginning that I'm the CEO of the company. So, these are the products that we have. Um, and I'm just talking about my journey. So uh, this is a full disclosure that I have, all, uh, of course, conflict of interest with what I'm presenting here, but I'm hoping that this is the real journey and what I've learned so that actually can help with uh, the decisions that you may want to make in this, um, in this path. Uh, we also have Uh, we also have other devices for um, total body photography, handheld devices with cross polarized lighting that can offer actually better imaging systems. Um, this was uh, our for to make um, imaging and dermatology more affordable. You don't need to invest in a big machine. You could actually use a handheld device and take high quality images for total body photography uh, with different uh, body parts and what you need to document. Um, we built this Derm Engine platform, our software solution that actually can cover different stakeholders and patient journey. For example, if we are training our engine, our algorithms on the data that is only acquired by, um, from a dermatologist, for example, the system will be biased for that user um, profile. It may not work in the hands of GPs and primary care doctors. It may not work in the hands of nurses and um, medical assistants because the system is biased towards the data that you train the system on. So uh, I'm sure you all uh, know about like the bias in um, AI and machine learning. So this was the decision that we made at the beginning to build a system to serve different stakeholders in the patient journey. Patients themselves, nurses, primary care doctors, dermatopathologists, and dermato-oncologists and dermatologists. So we can say that the data is coming from real life settings and we know what happened to the patient in each stage. So our system is trained in all verticals. So it can serve different verticals and not just the dermatologist. It is also a connected solution. So we make sure to maximize the quality data that our doctors have. Um, they have access to system anytime, anywhere from any machine, including tablets, iPads, uh, Android phones, iOS, iOS phones, and even um, TV app that we have for Apple TV, and also web browsers on any computer or laptop. So it is accessible and it provides with quality data um, acquisition. Uh, the first step that we had in commercializing our AI tools was focusing on explainable AI. Uh, this is probably one of the topics that you've heard about when it comes to AI. Um, it could be a black box decision um, making tool that gives you, for example, this is 70% malignant. This is 20% malignant, this is the risk. But it doesn't explain to the physician or to the user, to the doctor, why the system thinks this is malignant or it's a high risk case uh, for malignancy. So we decided to use our AI algorithms in the, in, in the application that we um, can show our users 
what the system finds in similar cases and why the system is concerned about this case or has a high probability for malignancy. So we designed our first tool as visual search. You can select an image. The system will help you with finding similar cases from the database and it will show you the differential diagnoses from the similar cases. So in this case, if we tell the doctor, there's a 66% chance of uh, you know, being malignant in this, uh, in this case, they can look at the similar cases and understand why the system is um, classifying, for example, this case as malignant. Uh, that was actually a really good to start for the platform, uh, but we also, um, decided to add the diagnostic tool. It's not just about matching similar cases. How we can help our doctors, our nurses, our primary care doctors with diagnosing skin cancer better. So we um, designed a tool that is this diagnostic tool. It's not available in the commercial product yet. It's actually in our uh, clinical trials and we just started the process for submissions um, to uh, FDA after of course, the, um, uh, the process that we have in the current centers that we have in uh, Sydney, Australia, and also in Vienna, and then the US sites will follow for FDA submission. But today I'm gonna show you actually how it works, what it does. And hopefully soon this will be available um, after finishing the clinical validation and the studies to get the approval for the diagnostic tool that we have. Therm Engine um, is a platform that is designed to help you with documenting uh, spots and different skin conditions, hair and nail conditions accurately. So each spot has a profile. It provides you the tools that actually you can uh, have for comparing images over time. It can help you with identifying changed spots, if the treatment is working or not. Um, so this is the structure that we have. And these spots are mapped on patient 3D body map. So you can take images with your phone or digital camera. You can also take images with dermoscopy devices. On the dermoscopy device, um, you can go to visual search, the feature that I showed you, or you can go to the diagnostic button. This is showing that if you press on that, click on that uh, button, it will show you the probability map of different classes. In this case, we have five, um, uh, we have actually seven total classes, um, three of which actually are malignant melanoma, basal cell carcinoma, and this is including S uh, STC, squamous cell carcinoma. The other classes are benign. So using this feature, doctors can see the probability um, for this case to belong to these classes. And in this case, it's a very high competent BCC, basal cell carcinoma. Um, and if you compare that to the uh, explainable AI that I uh, mentioned, in that case, now they can look at similar cases to understand why this is a high um, risk case. So you can see similar cases, you can compare images, and this is exactly how we make diagnosis in dermatology by visual inspection and comparing the features that we see to what we've learned you know, through our experience in dermatology training. So I believe the right implementation for AI is really, really important. Maybe more important than the algorithms themselves because it is well uh, proven today that technology has the potential to serve um, doctors and patients. AI has uh, the great potential to help with diagnosis. But the real challenge is how you implement it how you bring it to a product that doctors will love it, will use it, they won't be against it. Because if you, say, if you say, doctor, here's my tool, it's gonna replace you. Of course, they won't like it, they won't like the product. But if you have a tool that is helping them with what they do every day, it is easy to understand. That will increase the chance of um, adoption and success in the market. So this was actually our user map um, right after we launched our devices. And it was really interesting to see uh, that we had this global um, traction that was showing us the problem that we are addressing is a global uh, problem. So this was really a few days after we launched the product.
And I think this was a good validation that we are on the right path, that we are addressing a real problem, a big problem, and there are many um, uh, people around the world who need this. So the um, the turquoise color is showing the professional users or doctors, and the red uh, pink circle is actually for patients uh, in the system. Um, I talked about our AI algorithms, and uh, I actually showed you a couple of applications of the system. Um, these algorithms were designed uh, based on the data that we had in the system and also the data that we had licensed from different centers, um, the publicly available data sets. Um, so to make sure that we have a good understanding of our performance, we decided to participate in an international challenge. Uh, it was uh, the ISIC challenge and our algorithms won the top three positions in that competition in 2018. This was against other algorithms and other teams participating in that challenge. Later, uh, the same team of organizers um, took these algorithms and compared them against human experts. How the AI system, how the AI algorithm is performing against human experts. And the result was published in Lancet Oncology in 2019 in June. And actually it showed that our system performance were actually great um, compared to individual doctors and um, we achieved a better accuracy compared to um, the human readers. This was a good validation, retrospective um, validation for the uh, potential that the system, the algorithms, artificial intelligence had to address this problem and help it diagnosing, in this case, dermoscopy images and skin cancers. Um, so here's the uh, ROC curve from that uh, publication that shows these blue dots are individual doctors and uh, the, uh, the red curve here is the uh, performance or ROC curve in that competition. You can see there are some doctors better than the system, uh, but if you look at the average physician's performance, there's um, a cross sign here. The algorithms had actually very good performance compared to the average human experts. Um, so this was the beginning of basically our process to move to now prospective validation. This showed that algorithms were performing well if you were, if they are looking just at the images and you compare that accuracy against human experts. But how this is going to work in real life in the hands of doctors was a real question. And now we are in the process of our clinical trials and validating them uh, in those settings. Um, there are also other studies in the market that actually, um, in, in the literature, um, that actually show the potential for AI and also now they are shifting the focus in these studies to implementation. Um, like this is a new study uh, published uh, in Nature in 2020, uh, recently actually, um, just a couple of months ago, um, that was comparing the accuracy of the uh, readers um, when you have single reader, one doctor, for example, then you have collective knowledge of doctors in diagnosing um, skin problems, and in this case, um, in dermoscopy images and skin cancer diagnoses. And also combining AI with that collective knowledge was actually best performing. Um, and this is showing that if you add AI as an assistant to the diagnosis, it will actually have a better performance. There's also another study recently published by um, the Google um, research team that they had this interesting study that they were looking at, again, the implementation and who should be the user of the AI system. Um, this was really interesting with um, looking at top one diagnoses versus top three diagnoses, differentials, uh, looking at different classes of skin diseases. For example, should it be um, 30 classes, should it be 500 classes? Um, how the performance will change if you change your settings? Uh, and also, it was showing that, this is actually my favorite graph from this uh, publication. It is showing that if the doctors, dermatologists, primary care doctors, and nurse practitioners, 
um, if they are confident five out of five, they are better than the algorithms. So if I know for sure 100% this problem that my patient has is skin cancer or acne, I don't need to use the AI system. I'm confident, I have experience, I have probably seen many cases and I can make a diagnosis, I don't need the machine to help me. However, when the confidence for these users, different types of users, different expertise, was actually lower than five, even like for four, the algorithm actually, the AI system was better. So it is showing that if doctors are not confident, they can use the AI system to improve their results. And also it was interesting, there were some cases when the nurses were five out of five confident, but since they don't have training, algorithms were better than them in diagnosing these skin problems. Anyway, this is another uh, publication that shows the focus is not now on showing the potential for technology. We all know AI and we all know um, uh, these advanced solutions will contribute to a better care, um, but we need to know how we should implement it. What is the best setting? Who should be the user? And how this is gonna contribute to a better care. Um, how we achieved this um, superhuman performance was really uh, by integrating the system with the current uh, software system so we could get the um, data, uh, the historical data for the patients. We could actually migrate the old um, the images from the old machines for our doctors. We have the dim engine data that is coming to the system every day. We also integrate with the pathology lab. So we are building this knowledge graph that is um, sourcing data from different resources to uh, build that knowledge. And now we can actually have our AI um, engine for reasoning and helping with clinical decision support for helping with workflow tools like e triage and also very soon actually help with the automated diagnosis. Um, as I mentioned, it's really important to have different verticals in the ecosystem covered for AI applications. I have seen many um, resources uh, talking about the vertical integration and why it is important. Um, it's actually, it, it, it has two different uh, reasons, I believe. One is that if you have this vertical uh, integration and if your AI system is learning from the patient data, from primary care, from dermatologists, pathologists, surgeons, and oncologists, you will have the real outcome data in the system. You will know what happened to the patient. It is not just one doctor looking at the image and saying, oh, this is, for example, cancer is benign. We will know what happened to the patient because the system is used in the patient journey all the way um, you know, to the treatment phase. Um, it is also important to note that if you have this type of implementation, now from the business perspective, this is a very difficult um, implementation to copy. Like your competition, if you're thinking about a business, it may be easy to have an app for patients, but it's not easy to have an app that is serving patients, also to have the service side and have um, the uh, providers and also cover different tiers and different verticals in the, um, in the ecosystem. So I believe if you have this solution, you can now have your AI system as a service. You can have your AI that can serve surgeons. You can have your AI engine that can serve doctors in the primary care level and even um, patients from home. Um, uh, now looking at the engine, um, like in our case, uh, we um, designed a derm engine platform that can basically be the main source of data coming every day, new data coming to the system. So it's evergreen. As doctors are using the system, it, it sees more data, it just, um, it gets more and more intelligent. Uh, we also have our integration tools that actually we can help with bringing EMR data with lab um, data and also other systems. In our case, we also extended our input data to other modalities, not just images, you know, with dermoscopy. You can have digital um, camera, um, you can have uh, pathology slides, you can have genomic information, and 
these are all important data points who will contribute to the better diagnosis for your patients. So today our focus is dermoscopy and just general um, dermatology imaging, but the system is capable of extending to those domains and modalities to support better. So this is my um, favorite slide of uh, how our decisions contributed to um, this uh, adoption. So basically today, serving over 1 million patients and uh, we have over 4 million cases. This is showing the real hockey stake of doing the right thing so that your doctors like the platform, like your product, um, like your tool, and they use it so you have more data and this is actually contributing again to better systems, more users, and this is a positive loop that gives you that exponential growth basically in, uh, in the business uh, after you have the first set up, of course, the product and the, uh, the algorithms to serve the, um, the users. Um, in our efforts to lead this AI um, uh, applications in dermatology, we also looked at automation of dermatology as well, not just having diagnostic algorithms, but how we can help our doctors to be better with documentation, how we can help them with um, documenting, imaging, more efficiently. Because if you look at dermatology, it's really time consuming. When you examine your patient, you take images of every single spot and then you document it. So we designed our derm drone, which is a small mini drone, automated, uses AI for automated navigation. So we can scan the patient under two minutes and basically it is now comparing images over time. You can um, have your patient come in uh, every three months, every six months based on their risk factor. Um, and you can automate this exam and the AI system can compare images and help with diagnosis. So this is our new innovation. Uh, just file the patent and receive the favorable opinion for the, uh, for the claims that we had for this as the first um, medical drone. Uh, for indoor navigation and medical exams. Uh, and this is, uh, you can see it's very new, the, the PCT application that we filed. And also, not only it helps with imaging documentation, but also it creates a 3D body map of the patient. And now you can um, document and track changes uh, much more efficiently and much more accurately using the patient body map. So in addition to that, uh, we are also now shifting our focus to general dermatology. Uh, again, dermatology is a big, big problem. We have many difficult conditions, rashes, inflammatory diseases, and it was really um, the right time for us after perfecting our, our tools for skin cancer and moving to the diagnostic space with approvals, we shift our R&D focus to general dermatology. So now we are working on this problem, how we can take an image using any digital camera. Um, this can be for serving patients in remote areas in Africa in different countries uh, who don't afford necessarily to have is uh, a dermatologist to serve these patients, but they will afford to have a mobile phone for imaging. How we can have our AI engine to help in those scenarios. So now we are working on rashes, uh, atopic dermatitis, psoriasis, acne, um, and also rare uh, dermatology problems and misdiagnosed, uh, difficult to diagnose cases in dermatology. Um, I, th I should thank everyone in our team for, uh, what they've done, their hard work, their passion, their dedication to make a difference. This is our small team when we started, uh, my PhD supervisor and our young team of students and interns that we had and co-op students, really like the backbone of the company. Uh, I think we did the, um, the right thing and invested in our, in our young talents who are now part of the company. Uh, actually and uh, continue building this uh, to be a successful uh, global business that can serve millions of patients. I'm usually asked about like how difficult it is to be a technical CEO, how difficult it is to be a female CEO, um, a first time CEO, um, an immigrant CEO. And I always say it's really difficult to build a successful business. It is also really difficult to be um, a successful scientist and like build a product 
or um, do research that will actually have real impact. When you combine them together, yes, it's actually really, really difficult. But what I've learned is that it is difficult no matter what you do if you want to be successful. Like if you look at entrepreneurs, doesn't matter what is the domain they are working, what doesn't matter what is their gender, doesn't matter if they are the first time CEO or not, it is difficult. So infinite plus something is still infinite. So then I just say, okay, just have fun and do what you do. It's not really about um, the challenges we have, it's about the mindset that we have and how we navigate through these difficult decisions to do the right thing and serve at the end. Um, and I think I should also thank Majid, uh, my husband, my co-founder and our CTO who was with me along the way from the beginning. I think it's really also important to have someone with you um, who will tell you in your difficult days, um, don't worry, we've got this, we are together. It doesn't matter, it's just a matter of time, we'll get there. <laughs> so uh, that was also, uh, I believe one of the most important factors for our success today. Majid is the brain behind the company, behind the product, a great leader uh, with a great vision. Uh, and I'm so lucky to have him and also to have everyone in our, in our uh, company. Um, I'll be more than happy to answer your questions and the panel that we will have. And also you can always found, uh, find me. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to, uh, to answer and to help. Thank you. All right, um, Dr. Sadr, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Um, thank you for sharing with us your interesting journey. Uh, I liked it a lot and I learned a lot of lessons. Um, uh, so I, I was looking at the um, chat room to see if there is any questions that the audience have. Um, okay. Um, tell people uh, you know type in i have like personal questions that i, I like to ask you um mm -hmm. for all of us here uh, in this event um we have like three passes in front of us right first of all first pass is like being like a pro professors and look doing some research and publishing papers right and the second path is like um going to the industry and work for others right and the third one is um, the path that you took, right? Um, launch your company and uh, the other people come and work for you, right? Uh, as a, like a successful entrepreneur in this field, um, if you wanna quantify or rank these three paths for like with this like metric that spend energy and time over the reward, what is your comments on this? Um. First, um, thank you so much for having me today here. Um, I uh, really want to be there and be in person, but I know with COVID-19 and everything happening, yeah. it's not possible. So I'm still Thank you for I'm accepting our invitation. <laughs> thank you. Actually, I was camping last night in our beautiful mountains in Vancouver and arrived this, uh, is, yeah. this evening, and it's 10 o'clock, actually 10, 20 uh, p.m. Uh, in Vancouver. But I came to the office. I was so excited to be part of the event. Thank and you. Thank you, um, every one of you who basically included me. Um, the question that you had, um, Ali, it's actually uh, what I experienced myself. Um, I had my academic position, my research associate position at, at SFU, Simon Fraser University, after my postdoc. Um, I started the business during my postdoc uh, because I was going to work for another company. I went to the industry. And um, there was a really interesting story there. I asked them to raise my salary because I had $30,000 scholarship. And they told me that, um, no, we cannot raise your salary because postdocs are not paid high. And I told them that I will work really, really hard and I'm bringing like this experience and the expertise. But anyway, that didn't work. I, I continued my uh, academic position. Um, I was like um, managing and running two startups because I had a new lab at SFU 
And it was on digital health. I really enjoyed that as well. I was working with my students, but actually our students at SFU. And also I had started a company. At one point, uh, when we had, of course, uh, investments um, from professional investors in the business, they ex uh, expect you to focus on the business because at the beginning they are investing in founders really. So um, I actually uh, had in that short time experience of working for a company, um, the experience of um, having an academic position and also starting uh, the business. Honestly, running the research lab was very similar to my entrepreneurship experience you have to apply for funding um, you have to find really good students you have to have really good skills in problem solving and uh, you have to keep your lab your research group running which is a small scale of what you do in the business right uh, you need to bring funding to build a business um, you need to have really good employees and hire your team um, it was really similar but i can tell you maybe 10 times 100 times harder um just because it's much more difficult to get grants and r d funding for a company compared to a research center uh, at least like in canada we have great programs um that i know for example but it was more difficult when it comes to the business establishing a business, running a business, growing a business. So I think at the end, um, I'm glad I've done what I've done. If I go back, I will do exactly the same. Uh, but when my sister asked me um, if she should start her business, I told her no. <laughs> I told her probably um, because it's really, really tough. And then she told me, what do you mean you can't do it, then I cannot do it? <laughs> My answer was like, no, I really love you. I don't want you to go through everything I've done, but I'm happy with what I've done. And I think if you have passion, if you really want to work hard, um, I have had many days and nights uh, with Majid, my, my uh, co-founder, my husband and our CTO in the office working late nights and not complaining because that's really what you love to do. So um, again, I think it's tough to be successful. Doesn't matter what you do. Even like as as an academic um, professor, um, it's very competitive these days to get grants and you know be successful in running um, the research lab. So they are all equally good, and also it depends like to your personality and what you would. Uh, how much risk you would like to take, I would say. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. So my understanding is, is, is there is no definitive answer for these questions, and it depends on the personal like preferences that each one can take. That's right, that. yeah. All right, so there are some uh, questions here. Uh, how do you uh, automate legend size area calculating using AI? Um, I think it's uh, important because I've, I've, I have received similar questions uh, from great students, scientists, researchers, um, like because I, probably they found my previous work and my publications in this domain. Um, so these days we are not really um, using image processing methods to segment or measure things. We have um, we have a hybrid model that we use image processing, pre-processing, post-processing, but we usually use our AI engine and deep learning models for learning these features, these um, um, basic important measurements uh, from the data. For example, if you have a skin lesion and if you are using segmentation or a measurement for segmenting region and measuring size or color, um, it can be very, very um, subjective because you need to have ground truth data, right? And if you give your images to the doctor to label them, if you have three doctors, I can guarantee you will have three different segmentations. So we started with that. I actually published data um, and actually my results in analyzing images, segmenting regions, measurements, but then you don't have ground truth because there is no ground truth. Like if you say, I'm gonna segment the lesion here, I may play safe and I may actually extend the lesion boundary to have more um, normal skin pixels. So that's why we don't um, segment and measure lesions in our system today. 
I've worked on it before, but we actually focus on the features that the system can learn to give us the, the heat map of what is normal, what is not normal. In that case, you will be good if you have a lesion with segment, multi-part uh, lesion. For example, there's a skin disease that you have patches of abnormal skin or disease. Um, in that case, the system will work. You don't need to worry about how many segments it will have. You don't need to worry about the device you are imaging because the system is learning from millions of data points. Um, and that's all we do in, in the product. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is about uh, data acquisition for deep learning. Um, uh, Mariam asked that, how do you collect such data for training your algorithms? Um, it's, a, it's a really good question. I think it's a problem that many systems have. It's called the start, right? Um, so when you have, when you want to use deep learning, then you want to use machine learning and you need real like data to get it started, where you start so you have a product that others will use and will give you that real data. So as I actually presented, we use different sources of data. We have integrations with other systems. Um, for example, one hospital had five big machines with 10 years of data that they needed our system to centralize that access so they could actually have access to their machines and to their historical data for their patients. We did that, and in return, the system could use the data to be intelligent and help those doctors and patients. Um, so that was the, um, the model that we have. We, ha we have also licensed data uh, from university programs, from the research centers, um, that actually we have the right of use for some of the features like visual search, I, I actually presented in my slides that we are matching the case with historical cases and we are showing you similar images. In that case, those are not real live patient data. Those are licensed images. Because we don't want to surprise a doctor by showing their data to someone else. It's all about patient privacy and also um, the right of use for the data. So we have uh, a collection of images that we can use for those um, explainable AI features. We also have the right of use for the derm engine data when, I, when we are helping our doctors and our patients. The system itself can learn from the data to serve the doctors and patients. We don't sell the data to others. And uh, of course, it's a part of the uh, terms, of you, uh, terms of use for the system. Oh, okay. Then, and, and I'm assuming that these data are not publicly available, right? No, absolutely like, not, yes. Right. Yeah. Some data that we have could be uh, uh, publicly available, that we have licensed, others can also license, but not their main data. Mm -hmm. Okay. For those parts that you're saying is um, okay, the others use it. Where is the, uh, is there any special location or site for them, for people to just download them or no? Um, no, actually we have purchased the right of use. For example, there's a big data set um, that there are like 2,000, uh, 20,000 images. There's another one about 10,000 images. Um, those are good starting points, but really like honestly, it's not about that data when it comes to success of a product. Um, I think we need to have a real like great engineering mind. At the same time, we need to look at the medical application, the clinical side, what really works, what doesn't work. You may have 1 million images, uh, but if you don't design the system that can help you with um, the features that you have and doctors love it and use it, then you only have one million images. You're not gonna grow, right? But if you have 10,000 images, but you build a system where your doctors love it, then it's gonna just give you more and more data. And that's, uh, I believe, really, really important for real life data so that um, our system is performing better than human experts, not in that level, right? Because you are learning from so many thousands of doctors to serve a patient in front of you. Okay. Uh, Massa asks that, um, how do you build trust in patients when you first launch the app and convince them to use it? Interesting question. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a actually, it's a really good question. We started with our devices um, that actually I showed in the, um, in the slides as well. So we had these Moscow devices um, that patients could use. And then we had an application that doctors could serve these patients online. We realized that doctors needed the tool more than patients. 
So we actually shifted our focus to physicians. In healthcare specifically, trust is a really, really important matter. For example, um, there are many apps in the market, like you can search for skin cancer, I'm sure you will find maybe 10 applications, but they don't necessarily have the success that we had just because we didn't want to just have an app that can tell you this is 30% malignant. Okay, then what, right? Imagine you tell a patient that you have 30% chance of having melanoma and then you leave the patient alone, what will happen to the patient? For that reason, we decided to work with our doctors, with best centers of excellence and with the ones who are leading science in this field. And then they serve their patients. So our model is B2B2C, business to business to customer or consumer. Um, uh, with that, then our patients are trusting their doctor. Their doctor is using True. the system. So basically it's a hierarchy of trust. You trust, um, basically patients trust their doctors, doctors trust you, so patients yeah. trust you. Right. Exactly, exactly. And also, uh, it's really important, like one of the recent um, projects that we have is um, integrations for genomic labs. For example, if you have a new gene test for um, genomic test for melanoma or other skin cancers, um, we actually implement that so these partners and businesses can use our platform. In that case, we are designing the patient app because you also need to know how to design the app to be user-friendly for your patients. It is really different. It's, it shouldn't be technical. It should be um, you know, user-friendly and all those important matters that come to action with product development and product design. Um, but you're right. Uh, we actually gain our patients' trust by having the system used by best centers around the world. So if you know Melanoma South Australia is using your platform, that is the top center globally, right? So then, of course, their patients um, are having system. Mm -hmm. um, Yusuf asked that, uh, what is the fastest way uh, to label a lesion using the pathology diagnosis or the collective opinion of a bunch of experts? Um, it depends. If you are looking at malignant cases, you want to make sure you have pathology confirmation. For example, um, our system, when we started, since it was deployed in cancer centers, we had a lot of malignant cases, which is really difficult to have. Like if you go to a random company in this space, they probably have 99% benign case and very actually um, a smaller size of malignant cases because it's difficult to have cancer cases, but anyone can image a mole and say, I have a spot like they done now, right? In our case, we actually had more malignant cases and more pathology labeled cases. It's really important to have that for malignancy um, because you want to make sure your ground truth was um, the uh, confirmed diagnosis because we know our physicians, for example, primary care doctors, 39 benign biopsies for one melanoma, 97% false positive and unnecessary procedures. Therefore, we cannot trust the doctor's labeled data if our doctor is not a specialist. Even if you go to the dermatologist, there's 66% false positives and unnecessary biopsies because they play safe, right? Even if they just have a small doubt, like quick, you know, just a small concern that this could be malignant, they will biopsy it. Therefore, if you just learn from labeled data by doctors, your system will be as good as them. Yes, collective knowledge will be better, but it's really difficult to do. It's really expensive to do. Our doctors are busy, they don't have time. But the only way to learn this was actually connecting with pathology labs directly and learning from this as doctors use it. So we add additional pathology tools as well. For that, um, Massa asked another question, uh, which I think you already answered. That is about the um, data acquisition, uh, which you said for the beginning you just bought some data, like uh, like data set, right? Yeah. Um, so let, let me skip to the next question. Um, um, how the algorithms work in academic should be different from them in business? based on your experiences? Um, this is a really, really good question. I think that's what differentiates engineers um, from like 
comparing you working on your computer in the lab versus you going to the clinic and hospital and working as um, as someone responsible for the outcome of your algorithms. In the academic side, we uh, you know we compare our algorithms, uh, accuracy, performance against the labels they put in front of us, right? Our decision does not have any impact on patients' lives. This is retrospective. It's already done. We have the images, we have the data, and we use our algorithms to, um, to uh, label and compare accuracy. When you take it to the clinical world, it's very, very different. One thing is bias. In the algorithms that you design in the lab, in the academic side, for example, you have 10,000 images. Your algorithms are working 95%. You're good, right? Because, okay, you have a table of excellent results and you can publish that. Now you take that system to the clinical side, to the hospital. It will fail if your users are using different devices. It will fail if your patient has a different skin type. It will fail if your user is not the right user for your platform. For example, the paper recently published by Google that I actually presented in my slides that shows doctors with confidence of five out of five, they don't need AI. They should not use AI. You already know what is the case. What's the point of using AI and leaking that error to your diagnosis? And then if you are a primary care doctor, there's a different threshold when and who should use the system is really, really important. In the academic side, it doesn't really matter. Like we have labels, we have images, we have the amazing algorithms and it can just give us the, the table. And I know, for example, there's a huge bias in the data that you will find if you're just developing algorithms because this is coming from one center. It's really important what is the patient ethnicity, patient color, the devices they had used for collecting images so much bias in the data that actually you may have an amazing result published in an article, but if you take it to the clinical side and real life settings, it will fit. There are actually many companies, if you're interested in this domain, you can look at Melafine, for example. They even had FDA approval, but it failed because it was designed to be um, used by dermatologists, but derms are usually confident five out of five. They don't need the system, right? In real life, it fails. So it's really important to understand all of those um, risk factors. So like when you are um, designing a system that is regulated in healthcare, for example, you have risk analysis and you have risk mitigation. So you have to identify all of the risks that you will have. Um, your user type, your patient type, and all the different biases, um, gaps in the system that you may have, and you need to predict and then your mitigation. So with, with the right strategy, you can start. It doesn't have to be perfect 100%, but you just need to have those risks communicated with your users so they know what to do. Mm -hmm. um, just one question that popped in my head is, um, if you want to um, say the how much in your business, right? How much was the um, marketing impact on to being a successful, like having a successful business? uh and like the the product you have how was the portion of it marketing business um product? i think uh we had almost zero marketing dollars so i don't think marketing was big in our case uh for example um direct marketing let's say however having some of the top centers who use the platform from the beginning um, really help because those doctors are presenting our our, our tools uh, in conferences. I have actually so many photos of different conferences. One doctor sent me that, Mariam, I saw Dr. X, who is the best in this field, was presenting your product. Congratulations. I was like, oh, I didn't know Dr. Menzies is presenting, or I didn't know Dr. Cloud was presenting. So it was really important to have the right um, early adopters because they are your champions. Our doctors, you know how difficult it is to get a contract with a hospital. It's just almost impossible if you don't have internal champions who really, really want your product so badly that they will fight for it. So in our case, um, our dermatologists uh, were convincing the hospital CEO, CFO, CIO that they need the tool. So they were using the grant funding to pay for it. They were using um, donation monies at the beginning. So it really... Actually 
But actually, that the, actually that's the best um, marketing type because it's in person. Yeah. They vouch for you basically. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh. Your champions, um, the, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, but we didn't have any dark uh, marketing money, anything. Like, of course, as a startup, you know, like you start and you're just, <laughs> yeah, broke already when you start the business. Yeah, that, that's a big challenge for any startup is how, how you want to just introduce your product to the board to just, uh, you know. You need definitely to have something that your doctors love, right? So it's about the right product. I had that um, little positive loop. I believe it was exactly like what we did. We had a small product, and then we were working with our doctors as their team. They told us we are better than our own IT team in the hospital. (laughs) This was a really good compliment. Imagine, like, hospitals in Australia, in Sydney, with this time difference, and we were serving them from Vancouver. Anyway, so it's a longer story. We had a local line that was connected to our phone. And Majid and I, basically, we were receiving these phone calls from doctors middle of the night <laughs> from the hospital that they had a question. So it's been a fun journey for sure. And um, it just shows that you need to have the right product, of course. But um, it's more like the right strategy, how you uh, position. And also... Um, to make sure you don't jump ahead of yourself. There were so many companies, there are luxury companies who make like bold claims in AI. Like they call it diagnostic when I know like it's impossible to have it at this stage just because there are so many rare diseases, there are so many eight cases, biases, and no one has addressed this so far. How you can claim that, right? But they do it. In our case, we didn't. In our case, we were very careful about our claims. Like, it's still we don't have a diagnostic claim. It's explainable AI, and I showed you, like, educational matching and pattern matching. That really helped because doctors see that you have for scientific backup for your claims, and you are doing it properly. Like, you just don't see it as a business. I always said, if I can give this tool to my mom, to my dad, to my family, to my loved ones to use, I can give it to mm-hmm. patients, right? That was, yeah. you know, from the beginning, the um, the culture the company had. So. All right, we have a question from Hussein. Transfer learning algorithms are widely used to improve the uh, generalization of training data set uh, to test data with the different distributions. Are these algorithms employed to solve the bias issue you mentioned in industry? Um, yes, and actually we also have um, had uh, some of those algorithms in different contexts. So Majid, our uh, CTO uh, and my co-founder, my husband, he has PhD in natural language processing. And he was actually, this was his expertise as well, like in, in, in his field. So we looked at different ways to do it. But honestly, it's really difficult when you have limited data. So there are different, um, uh, like, uh, transfer learning algorithms from different domains even, or, um, like, we did uh, multi-language translation and automated translation using transfer learning and different actual types of algorithms. But in this case, we use those um, techniques um, to help with some of the features, uh, but it's very limited. Uh, For example, your data, we know if you have clinical findings, it will help with your diagnosis. So clinical finding is symptoms. You have image and you have patient history, symptoms. You, as a doctor, you combine your visual information also the patient context and clinical findings, and then you make a decision, right? In the system today, we are using only visual data. Why? Because it's really difficult to have that clinical finding clean data set for the data that you have. So you have to build it in the future. Yes, we will actually have more, but um, yes, they are helpful. Uh, but in the current system that we have, um, and also like in this domain in general, um, there are challenges um, with the data and the gap that you have really to, to accomplish meaningful results. Okay. Um, the next question is from uh, uh, Mahmoud, which says, have you, um, have your project in line of dermatologist level classification of a skin cancer with DIP neural networks, Department of Electrical Engineering, Stanford University, have the same goals? Uh, 
Um, there are many university programs working on this problem. Also, I did in my PhD at SFU and UBC work on this pro, um, a problem. So the, the platform that we have, it is not just about one algorithm. We have over 44 algorithms in the system. But when you talk about AI and dermatology, everyone thinks there's one algorithm that will give you the label for diagnosis. We actually have many workflow algorithms. We use AI, for example, in our derm drone for automation. Uh, indoor navigation, patient identification, body part detection, there are like many algorithms that we have in the system. Um, there are different groups working on this problem. Uh, there was uh, the, one of the top publications from na actually in Nature was from Stanford. I know the group very well. There are many, yes, many different groups actually who also competed in that ISIC challenge and also they keep competing in the international challenges. Um, the goal that we have for the platform is not just to have a dermatologist level diagnostic system. Their engine is designed to digitize the ecosystem. So all other products, partners, vendors can join and provide their solution to the ecosystem. Having a growing network of millions of patients is really, really powerful. So if there is a new system, it doesn't matter, Stanford, Harvard, University of Tehran, anywhere. If there is a new solution that is approved, that has the quality, has the chance to connect to our system and uh, actually to be offered to the network of patients and physicians that we have. Again, we are in integrating with another system that has genomic diagnostic tests. It's not about image processing or computer vision. It is about genomic tests. So it is designed to, again, serve the ecosystem, not just have basically one algorithm. Um, so yes, the same goal we have. However, the image is the vehicle for all of those products in the future to be offered globally. And also we are the only global platform that can serve patients in the US. We have HIPAA compliance, we have GDPR compliance, we can serve patients in Europe. Now we are actually starting our um, UK implementation um, and because of a government contract that we are working on. Uh, we have Australia, APAC. Actually, I have the pleasure of working with some of our amazing doctors in Iran. This is a new project, and I think the best outcome from this event for me could be finding amazing scientists and students who want to be part of the project. It's really exciting. Um, we are working on the um, our new AI engine for general dermatology, addressing rare diseases, difficult to diagnose cases, and general dermatology. If you look at dermatology, it's so difficult. Over 2,000 different diseases, they look very similar, and also they don't look similar. One problem, for example, early stage, you know, um, middle of the treatment, end of treatment, they look totally different. It's a really challenging task for our doctors. So it's also difficult for machine. However, we have uh, multinational 25 centers globally working on this problem now. And actually, I've had the uh, pleasure of uh, really, you know, having a chance to work with our doctors in Iran. That's actually my new project too weeks ago we started, we already have about 16 doctors who have shown interest. So if from the uh, from the audience here, if you're part of any of the research labs in the universities, please, please contact me. We will have a great project. Um, of course, from the uh, medical side, it's a great experience for your students, for interns, uh, to have the chance to work with real life setting with hospitals and also with the product that is deploying what you're building into real life applications. So I use this opportunity for advertising our new study, but it's a multi-center study um, okay. with over 25 centers. All right, great. Um, Majid asked that actually is an interesting question. Um, uh, if a big company wants to buy your startup to join in the biggest phenomenon, are you accepted? Um, it depends. Um, we, I, I don't think it's the right time now. Um, money. Yeah, so we actually had uh, we had an offer already for our uh, hardware devices, um, but we decided not to do it just because I believe we are at the beginning of this journey. And really, like if you are acquired by another company, you don't have any control necessarily. Um, not always, but most of the cases, on um, the direction that you are going. So I don't think we have 
um, figured out everything. So we still need to have that flexibility of how to do it, what to do when. That's why um, not yet, but I'm sure um, most of startup companies at the end, they end up with going IPO, which means a different management probably at one time, you know, growing the business with, um, or acquisition or um, yeah, merging with, uh, with other business. We are open to all possible scenarios, but I don't think today is the right time for that decision. All right. So um, do you want to add any comment on AI bias and ethnics that you mentioned? Um, yeah, so that is, uh, I think I already mentioned some of those important points. Um, so this is really what you need to consider when you are out of your research lab, now you are going to real life implementations. Because like in the research lab, you have data in front of you um, and you develop algorithms, you test, train, you know, evaluate, and then you have results, you present, publish. But now when you go to real life setting, it's really important to make sure that you understand what your AI can do and what your AI cannot do. Knowing what it cannot do is much more important than one, what it can do. For example, we have amazing results when it comes to dermoscopy. We have the best system for AI in skin cancer diagnostics. It is validated. Lancet Oncology is the highest journal I could wish to have a publication, right? For me, it's one of the top. I'm not the author in that article, unfortunately, but it's about our algorithm, so I can take the credit a little bit. But actually, it doesn't matter. When you go to the clinic, to the center, to the cancer center, and you say, my system, even if it's approved, okay, your data did not have dark skin patients. For example, we have six types of skin color, like skin type one, two, three is like, um, uh, you know, highest for skin cancer, and then four is my skin type, like three, four, and then darker skin, right? So with darker skin, you don't have enough data from darker skin in your uh, application, but I have never seen any system saying that our AI cannot serve darker skin patients. And this is not fair, right? So that's why I think that bias is really important. So when it comes to data bias, to make sure that you are exactly understand where it will fail and you bring it up yourself. You don't wait for others to say, by the way, your system failed here. My patient was dark skin and your system did not detect it. Rather than that, you need to identify this and actively go and solve that problem. So bias is really important. For example, if we have used iPhone phones for data collection, and of course, not every single center affords to have an iPhone, not every single doctor will afford to have an iPhone, right? Now you take your product to the market and they are using, for example, old phones or Samsung or other devices. Of course, your algorithms will fail because the bias is in the data acquisition tool that you've had and you never talk about it, right? You just talk about the amazing results and the tables and publications. So this is really important. I think it's one of those topics that I'm really interested in myself because now I have experience of implementing this I can see what really is important in the clinical side, in the real life setting, not just the research side and the lab and limited data that you have. That is one. The other thing is ethics. Um, so machines can do a lot. Like AI will be capable of doing many things. And AI will be what we teach it to be. We can use AI for good. We can use AI for bad. The same AI system that can help patients and doctors can also be used by insurance companies and companies who just have, not necessarily all insurance companies are have bad intentions, but they could have, right? To manipulate their systems for patients. And that's actually really, really tough. Like there are areas that the system needs to be in good hands because if the system is in bad hands, it can also do a lot. So those are the um, really important matters. I don't know, like not necessarily all of you are working in dermatology or necessarily healthcare in AI, but like, about your own domain, when you think about what are those biases, uh, where it will fail, what you need to know, what you need to communicate uh, with your users, and also where are the uh, ethical concerns, how it can be misused so you prevent those from happening. Great. Um, so I think there's no any further questions and I just want to thank you for your great and inspiring 
presentation. Uh, and I just want to add something that um, the audience and the, in, in, you know, the attendees, if they have any further question or, uh, you know, possible collaboration, um, your contact will be shared with them so they can directly contact you through email or link. Um, so if you have any further comments or concept for your last um, thank you, Ali. Again, it was a great, great pleasure to be here. So you can find me online on LinkedIn or um, through the email. Uh, it's mariam at medoptima.com. Very simple. You will remember it. That's happy great. to connect. Happy to be part of your projects. Happy to um, contribute a little bit to your journey. And uh, it's really good to have this rewarding journey that you work hard also it's actually paying back and you get this positive feedback from your doctors from your patients um and i wish the best for everyone and uh, it doesn't have to be cancer it doesn't have to be gynecology uh, i'm sure you're all working hard with passion and drive and vision to do good so uh i wish you all the best and happy to connect and happy to collaborate if you have projects that we can help to take to the market to serve me millions of patients together globally. Great. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.